Sabrina and I met in college during our junior year. Initially, our relationship was on and off. We both enjoyed each other's company and the physical aspect of our relationship, but neither of us was ready to commit fully. However, halfway through our senior year, we reconnected and decided to stay together. Six months after graduating, we got married. Soon after our wedding, my parents celebrated their 25th anniversary. During the festivities, I asked my father how he and my mom had managed to stay so happy together all those years, especially when other couples seemed to constantly argue. His advice was simple yet profound, tell your partner you love them every day and show them through your actions. Never let them doubt your love. Taking his words to heart, for the next seven years, I made sure to express my love for Sabrina Daly. I remembered every special occasion, big or small, and created nonsense anniversaries as excuses to surprise her with gifts. However, despite my efforts to emulate my parents' relationship, Sabrina interpreted my gestures differently. What I saw as expressions of love, she sometimes perceived as signs of my insecurity or attempts to seek her attention. Despite these misunderstandings, our careers thrived. We both advanced in our respective fields, which demanded more time and energy, often leading to late nights and occasional business trips. There were nights we barely saw each other, me arriving home after Sabrina had gone to bed, or vice versa. I accepted this as part of the sacrifices required for success, assuming Sabrina did too. When we were together, I made every effort to compensate for the time we spent apart. Our physical intimacy was incredible. There were weekends where we never bothered getting dressed. Sabrina would smile and assure me that she was mine forever, and I believed her wholeheartedly. However, my perception changed at her company's Christmas party, held at a downtown hotel. The party was scheduled for Wednesday night, starting at 7. Due to an unexpected change with a client, I couldn't arrive until around 7.30, despite originally planning to meet Sabrina earlier. When I entered the ballroom, I spotted Sabrina with a man I didn't recognize. Not knowing many of her colleagues well, except through occasional gatherings like this, I felt a pang of curiosity as Sabrina had her arm around him. Following them into what appeared to be a vestibule with three adjoining rooms, I checked the first two, finding them empty. Just as I was about to try the third room, I heard giggling. Despite the room appearing vacant, the sound emanated from an air vent, revealing their conversation next door. Listening in, I overheard snippets of a conversation that shattered my assumptions about our relationship. Be careful, don't tear the dress. How am I supposed to get to your tits? Let me show you. Rena, I never get tired of looking at those beauties. Let me lick those fantastic nipples. Not until you get my toy out. You can't play with my tits until I can play with your cock. The realization hit me hard. The conversation continued. Do we have time to run up to one of the hospitality suites for a quickie? I need your pussy. I need it bad. You just had it at lunch and for three hours on Monday night. You can wait until tomorrow. I can't wait. You'll have to. Bob said he'd be here by 8.30 and I need to be ready to greet him. If he catches me looking just fucked, he might start getting suspicious and we can't have that. Come on, if he's as much of a wimp as you say, we could fuck in front of him, and it wouldn't matter. My world shattered as I realized Sabrina's betrayal, her casual conversation revealing a side of her I never knew existed. It's true, lover. I could easily send him home and then talk my way out of it when I arrive, convincing him it was all a joke. But just because I know I could doesn't mean I want to stir up that kind of trouble. Are you absolutely sure we can't slip away for a quickie upstairs? I don't want to risk it, lover, but I can definitely help you take the edge off. There was a brief pause before the man moaned, Oh God, Rena, you're incredible at that. Your mouth is pure magic. I've never been sucked off this well before. For the next few minutes, there were sounds of pleasure and slurping noises, followed by, I'm coming, Rena, I'm coming. After a moment of silence, he added, You know what's so great about you, Rena? You swallow. My wife always spits it out. I swallow because you taste amazing, lover. Mark's going to be furious when I tell him you blew me and he has to wait until tomorrow. Maybe not. I thought you said we couldn't tonight. I said we couldn't go up to the hospitality suites. 
I didn't say anything about not giving a blowjob. How do you plan to manage that? Mark probably won't arrive until after your husband. Blowjobs don't take long, baby. I'll introduce you to Bob, slip away to the ladies' room, and when you and Bob chat, I'll sneak back here with Mark for a quickie. Damn, Rena, you're one wicked woman. I know, lover. That's why you love me. Are you going to rinse your mouth or kiss your hubby with my cum still on your tongue? It won't be the first time he's tasted you. You're evil, Rena. Wicked and evil. Come on, lover, we need to get back to the party. It's astounding how quickly love can perish. In mere moments, I went from devoted love and affection to absolute hatred. Throughout their conversation, I wrestled with myself. Should I burst in and confront them, or should I wait, gather more evidence, names, dates, and places? Acting now would lead to a he-said-she-said scenario in divorce court. I'd say what I overheard, and she'd deny it. I needed more information. Furthermore, kicking down the door might prevent me from finding out who Mark was or if there were other men besides Mark and the one with Sabrina in the adjacent room. No, I decided I would confront them eventually, but not that night. I quickly left the building and sat in my car until it was nearly the time I had told Sabrina to expect me. When I entered the ballroom, I spotted Sabrina seated at a table with two couples and a single man. Sabrina, at five foot eight, sat next to a man about six feet tall with black, wavy hair and a thin mustache, a look that immediately struck me as sleazy. Sabrina noticed me approaching, stood up, and extended her arms for a hug. She leaned in for a kiss, but I turned my head at the last moment, kissing her on the cheek instead. I feigned feeling unwell to avoid further contact, noting the surprise on her face. I think I'm coming down with something, sweetie. I wouldn't want you to catch it, I said calmly. She accepted my explanation and proceeded to introduce me to the others at the table. The man's name turned out to be Ron, and when he stood to shake my hand, confirming he was around my height, six feet. This detail mattered to me for reasons I kept to myself, I was mentally noting his physical stature. As we sat down, I engaged in conversation with Sabrina's colleagues, sensing an underlying tension from the two couples, as if they anticipated something disruptive. During a dance with Sabrina, she whispered in my ear, Will whatever you're coming down with tonight stop you from ravishing me later? I've been craving you all day. I internally scoffed at her audacity. What I wanted to say was, No, Sabrina, I don't think so, but I held back. I refrained from using her nickname Rena as Ron had done, not wanting to raise suspicions just yet. Instead, I replied diplomatically, let's see how things go when we get home. Unbeknownst to Sabrina, that night would be the last time she'd attempt intimacy with me. When we returned to the table after the dance, another man named Mark had joined them. He was around 5 foot 10, weighing approximately 180, with soft hands and a weak chin, details I mentally noted. About ten minutes later, Mark excused himself to visit another table, and I discreetly watched him. Unsurprisingly, he slipped through the door leading to the room where Sabrina had been with Ron earlier. Clearly, Ron had briefed Mark while Sabrina and I were on the dance floor. A few minutes later, Sabrina kissed me on the cheek and announced she was heading to the restroom. Ron engaged me in football talk, knowing I was a fan, using the conversation as a distraction while Sabrina slipped away to meet Mark. As I chatted football with Ron, I kept one eye on the door Mark had disappeared through. Less than a minute later, Sabrina followed suit. She returned to the table almost 15 minutes later, and I pretended not to notice how long she had been gone as I continued conversing with Ron. I wondered if Ron had picked up on the same thing I had. Sabrina had clearly been intimate, and Mark had received more than just a casual encounter. After a decade of marriage, I could read the signs, but I doubted Sabrina was aware of how well I knew her. After another dance with Sabrina, she whispered to me eagerly, molding herself against me. I'm incredibly horny, baby, so wet for you. I need you tonight. I was dripping in the bathroom. If this party weren't so political, I'd take you right now. The implication hung unspoken, making me wonder if kissing me with another man's essence on her lips or guiding me where another had been turned her on. As Sabrina danced with others, Mark eventually asked her to dance, and their return to the table was accompanied by smirks from the women, as if sharing a secret. 
I filed away their reactions. If Sabrina's behavior was common knowledge among her colleagues, finding out more wouldn't be difficult. Sabrina spent time at her boss's table, and when she returned, she whispered to me, full of urgency. I've been seen and danced with who I needed to. Race you home, lover. I needed bad. We drove separately, and I ensured she had a head start. Arriving home, I hurried to the bathroom and simulated being sick, staying there for several minutes before freshening up and finding Sabrina naked in bed. Sorry, baby, I don't know what's wrong, but I can't risk passing it to you. I'll sleep in the spare room tonight and call the doctor in the morning. She looked furious as I left the room. I woke early the next morning, sitting at the kitchen table, pretending to be unwell when Sabrina entered. Feeling any better? She asked. Not really. I hardly slept. Glancing at my watch, I added, the doctor's office opens at 8.30. I'll call work to let them know I won't be in today. I reached for the phone as she poured herself coffee and began getting ready for work. Don't forget I'll be late tonight, Sabrina said over the phone. We're still working on that damn budget proposal that has to be finished by next Tuesday. Yeah, I bet you will, I thought silently, hanging up without making any call. After Sabrina left for work, I dressed and headed to my office where I took care of urgent work, then informed my secretary I had a doctor's appointment and would be out the rest of the day. Leaving the office, I made my way to the public library. Using reverse directories, I quickly found addresses and phone numbers for Ronald Bragg and Mark Travail. Utilizing the library's computers, I delved into information about Sabrina's company. I gathered names, addresses, and phone numbers of corporate officers and board members. I also researched the backgrounds of top executives and the chairman of the board, assessing how they might respond to potential scandal. I was satisfied with what I discovered. Any hint of impropriety could likely result in severe consequences for Sabrina and her associates. That evening, I parked down the street from Sabrina's workplace. When she left around 10 after 5, I followed her across town. She drove to a motel parking lot and entered room 131 after knocking. Twenty minutes later, Ron arrived, parked, and joined them in the same room. It seemed they were indeed working on the budget proposal after hours, though I doubted their company was aware or would reimburse them. I noted down Ron's car details before heading home. During the drive, I contemplated what else I had learned about Ron and Mark. They were both married, but I lacked details on their relationships. Neither had attended the company party, which intrigued me. I resolved to gather more information about them and potentially involve them in my plans to confront Sabrina, Ron, and Mark. I also reflected on things I had previously overlooked, like Sabrina's habitual late nights on Mondays and Thursdays. I had always trusted her explanations, Mondays for weekend issues and Thursdays for report deadlines, but now I questioned my naivety. Love had blinded me, but I was beginning to see the truth. That night, I lay in bed reading until I heard Sabrina return. I feigned sleep as she peeked into the room, then heard her showering moments later. Sleep eluded me that night. I lay awake, staring at the ceiling, brainstorming ways to bring down all three of them simultaneously and ruin their lives. It had to be a coordinated strike. I couldn't risk any one of them discovering what was happening and taking preemptive measures. Once executed, I would reveal my role, ensuring they understood the consequences of their actions. Suddenly, an idea struck me. I sat up, turned on the light, and picked up the murder mystery novel I had been reading. It featured a man wrongly convicted of murder, framed with planted evidence. A lawyer and a private investigator were racing against time to prove his innocence before his execution. That was it, I realized. With newfound clarity, I set the book aside, turned off the light, and drifted into a peaceful sleep, confident in my plan. On Friday morning, I informed Sabrina that the doctor diagnosed me with a mild intestinal flu, recommending rest and medication for a speedy recovery. I'm still a bit weak, but I should be able to return to work by Monday, I told her. Sabrina touched my cheek affectionately. Rest up, lover. You'll need your strength. I've been missing you, she said before leaving for work. I got ready and left the house to continue my investigation. By day's end, I learned that Ron's wife worked as a legal secretary and had been absent from the party due to visiting her sick mother out of town. 
Mark's wife was a real estate agent who missed a party while closing a major deal on a $2 million property. Both marriages appeared stable, likely because their wives were unaware of their husband's extramarital activities. I intended to change that soon. I spent a quiet weekend at home, feigning recovery. On Monday, I informed Sabrina I felt well enough to return to work, though I planned otherwise. That evening, I followed Sabrina to the same hotel, where she entered room 146 to meet Ron, who greeted her at the door. Minutes later, Mark arrived and joined them. I noted down details of Mark's car before heading home. Still sleeping in the spare bedroom, I pretended to be asleep when Sabrina returned. I knew I needed a new excuse to avoid her. I couldn't claim the flu indefinitely, especially with my plan requiring at least another week to finalize. I decided to use one of Sabrina's own tactics against her. Whenever we argued, she would cut me off until she decided to reconcile, even if it meant withholding sex for months. Now, knowing the truth, her actions took on a darker meaning. She only cut me off, not her lovers. When I arrived home from work on Tuesday, Sabrina was waiting for me. How are you feeling, baby? She asked. Pretty good, I replied. Up for some fun in the bedroom, she teased. After dinner. I need to build up my strength a little bit more, I said, trying to maintain normalcy. I had been pondering all day about how to make Sabrina angry enough to cut me off from sex. The idea didn't come to me until quitting time, while I was walking to the elevator behind one of the file clerks. She was wearing slacks, and I found myself admiring her figure, suddenly struck with a plan. After we finished dinner and cleaned up, Sabrina washing dishes and me drying and putting them away, she turned to me expectantly. Ready to make up for lost time, lover? She asked. Lead the way, I replied, keeping my intentions hidden. As she undressed eagerly on our way to the bedroom, I couldn't help but wonder why she was so enthusiastic about sex when she clearly had little regard for me. She considered me weak and had even labeled me so to her boyfriend. Despite her contempt, she was pushing for intimacy. Well, after tonight, she wouldn't be pushing anymore. Arriving naked in the bedroom, she climbed onto the bed. I instructed her to get on her hands and knees, her favorite position. She grinned mischievously as she complied, wiggling her hips impatiently. Hurry, baby. I need it bad. I've gone almost a week without you and I'm going crazy, she purred. I moved behind her, running a finger into her wetness to prepare her. It struck me then that she was unusually wet, likely from an encounter with one or both of her lovers earlier. Was her urgency to have sex with me a way to pass off their leftovers? It didn't matter. Their secretions would serve my purpose. I withdrew my finger, coated in her and their fluids, and then entered her with my cock. Starting slowly, I inserted my wet finger into Sabrina's ass. Certainly, here is a rewritten version with the original content, but without the explicit details. What are you doing? She cried as she tried to pull away. You know I don't like that. I knew that was precisely the point. She attempted to move away, but I held her firmly. She reached the headboard, unable to go further, and my grip prevented her from turning aside. I withdrew from her and then entered her from behind. She screamed as I began thrusting. Stop it, please, she sobbed. I don't want this, you know that. How can you be sure, Sabrina? I asked, thinking, you've never tried this with me. Perhaps you found out with someone else that you didn't like it. Sabrina buried her face in a pillow, her sobs turning into moans. I smiled as I continued. It didn't last as long as I had hoped, but it served its purpose. Afterward, I got off the bed. Well, that was fun. I'll wash up, and then you can satisfy me. I'm feeling quite energetic tonight. Sabrina scrambled off the bed. You're a bastard. A complete bastard, she yelled as she ran from the room. She didn't speak to me for the rest of the week, and it pained me deeply. Executing my plan carried risks. If caught, I would face ruin. But my desire for revenge outweighed the dangers. It cost me, but if successful, it would be money well spent. Through connections, I acquired what I needed at a midnight meeting. By Sunday, I was prepared. When Sabrina left for work on Monday, my plan was set in motion. That night, 
I followed Sabrina to the motel. Once she and her two companions entered room 136, I acted. I found Ron's car unlocked and stashed contraband in the trunk. Mark's car required more effort, but I managed to place evidence inside. After ensuring the scene was set, I called the police from a nearby payphone. I reported a fabricated drug transaction in room 136, providing the car plate numbers without revealing my identity. I drove to another payphone and contacted all three local TV stations, providing them with the same information I had given to the police. With the recent election and the new mayor pledging a crackdown on drugs, I knew the police response would be swift. The TV stations were also keen on breaking the story. Afterward, I drove to a third payphone, called Ron's and Mark's wives, and informed them about their husbands being in room 136 at the Sea Breeze Motel with another woman. Then, I found a discreet spot nearby to observe the events unfold without drawing attention to myself. It took the police about 10 minutes to arrive, but another half hour passed before they were fully organized. Squad cars arrived first, followed by a SWAT van and unmarked cars carrying detectives. By the time they were set, news reporters had arrived and TV vans were in place. I watched as SWAT officers used a ram to breach the motel room door, followed by a dramatic entry with guns drawn. I couldn't help but wish I could see Sabrina's reaction when that door crashed open. Within minutes, Sabrina, Mark, and Ron emerged in handcuffs. Mark and Ron were partially dressed, but Sabrina was wrapped in a blanket, visibly shaken. I speed-dialed the president of Sabrina's company and briefed him on the situation, naming the individuals involved and detailing the ongoing bust at the Sea Breeze. I repeated the call to all members of the board of directors. Driving home, I anticipated the outcome, the planted evidence in Ron's and Mark's cars, and the drugs found in Sabrina's possession. Unsure if Ron's and Mark's wives were present in the crowd that gathered, I hoped they were. The story made headlines on the 10 o'clock news on channels 2 and 7. I chuckled when the anchor on channel 7 announced, Mayor Jones fulfills campaign promise as police dismantle major drug operation at local motel. Details of the seized contraband are pending. The segment featured footage of the arrested individuals labeled as drug kingpins, promising more updates to come. I turned off the TV, disconnected the phone, and went to bed. When Sabrina later asked me to use the house as collateral for her bail, I laughed. Eventually, she persuaded her parents to front the money. Upon her release and return home, she found the locks changed and her belongings boxed up in the driveway. Why are you doing this to me? She asked. I told her firmly, because you're a whore and I want nothing more to do with you. But you don't understand. If you would just let me explain. I saw all I needed to see when you were on the news, being led naked out of a motel room, and I closed the door in her face. I did help her father load all her belongings into a U-Haul, but I refused to discuss his daughter with him. Sabrina called two or three times a day, but I never answered, and when she showed up at my office one day, I had security escort her out of the building. She, along with Mark and Ron, coincidentally found themselves caught in a downsizing at their firm. Their legal troubles didn't fare well either, despite being first-time offenders. Due to the mayor's strict anti-drug policies, they didn't receive the probation leniency that others might have. Their continued denial of guilt, even when caught red-handed, didn't help their case. Sabrina especially harmed her own defense when she demanded a blood test that came back clean, allowing the prosecution to argue that the drugs found were intended for sale. In a bid to showcase swift results in the war on drugs, the three were offered a deal, one year in jail and 2,000 hours of community service. With good behavior, they could be out in nine months. Their lawyer advised them poorly, and they took the deal. While Sabrina was incarcerated, I filed for divorce, as did Ron's and Mark's wives. After their time in jail, I kept tabs on them. When the opportunity arose, I confronted Mark. I later heard he ended up with three broken ribs and a broken arm when he arrived at the hospital. He could have pressed charges, but I was willing to take my chances in front of a jury. A man defending his honor against someone who had wronged him might garner sympathy from the jury, anyway. It seemed Mark either anticipated this or felt remorse for his actions, so he didn't pursue it. Ron and Sabrina were still together, and one night I caught them leaving a bar. 
After I dealt with Ron and delivered a few kicks to his groin, I turned to Sabrina and said, Not bad for a supposed wimp, huh, Rena? Remember that Christmas party where you were with Ron in that back room? Remember his audacity, saying, If he's the wimp you say he is, we could do this right in front of him and get away with it. Remember all of that, Rena? I saw her expression change as she put it all together, and I chuckled. That's right, Rena. The so-called wimp got back at your cheating ways. You might want to call an ambulance for your boyfriend here. He doesn't look too good. She remained stunned as I got into my car and drove away. Write your opinion in the comments. Thanks for watching and have a great day.